Good morning, everyone. We're glad that you're here. Good morning to our streamers. We're glad you're able to participate in our assembly this morning. Our song to start off the service will be number 982. We shall assemble 982. We shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the throne. With humble hearts into his presence, we bring an offering of song, glory and honor and dominion unto the Lamb, unto the King. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing the song of the redeemed. We shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the throne with humble hearts into his presence. We bring an offering of song, glory and honor and dominion unto the Lamb, unto the King. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing the song of the Good morning, church. I'd like to welcome all the visitors. Um, we ask that you stay and let us get to know you a little bit. Y'all are in for a treat today. We're here to honor Rod. Um, today we are lifting him up as an elder, uh, which my personal opinion is a very deserving gesture. Um, if you're at this church for any time during the week, Rod is always here. He seemingly sleeps here when Maria's not home. Um, so this is, this is very deserving, and we look forward to the future with him and Brian and Will at the helm. Um, we ask that we continue to pray for the Solis family. Uh, we have a special collection today in the back. Uh, Will has left envelopes out to separate the normal con contribution from the special one. We continue to pray for Ken Collins, the brewer's son-in-law. They have a funeral service Looks like April 20th, visitation from 6 to 7 and service from 7 to 8. And the burial will be the following Monday. We continue to pray for Terry Mason, which is Elizabeth, Ed Elizabeth Edwards' mother. Um, she has suffered stroke-like symptoms and is basically under full-time supervision now. Um, so we continue to pray for her. We continue to pray for Sandra Roberts, who suffered a triple bypass surgery last Thursday, and she's recovering slowly. And the most recent, we pray for Raphael and his family, the Navarre's family, as last night he lost his mother. So we, we pray for him and the Navarre's family. I believe everyone was able to come and visit, so that's warming. Um, I believe that is all of the new information. So if you go with me to prayer with God. Father, we come to you this morning grateful for all that you do, grateful for the the blessing of our congregation and, and the fellowship that we share. We are grateful for those that have chosen to come and attend with us. And we ask that they stay and, and let us get to know them and 
hopefully our lesson is uplifting to you and also to them. We continue to pray for all those who are sick and injured on our prayer list. We pray for our military, Father, as there are still ongoing threats throughout the world that we will inevitably be involved in. We pray for Raphael and, and his family as he is going through the loss of his mother. We continue to pray for the Mason family, Father, and also the Brewer family. We ask that you guide Brian today in his sermon, and we ask that you also lift up Rod today as we welcome him to our eldership and let us continue this new journey that, that we are on with our leadership at this congregation. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Our next song before our second prayer will be, be number 742, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, 742. <clears throat> When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my riches gain I count by loss and poor Tempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my Lord. All the vain things. That charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. Worth the whole realm of nature mine that were a present too small love so amazing so divine demand my soul my life my Morning, brothers and sisters. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessed time that we can come together as your children to sing songs of praise and thanks to thee, to study thy word, to lift one another up, to help each other grow closer to you, Heavenly Father, through the Spirit in thy Son who showed us the way. We pray, Heavenly Father, you will be with the speaker today as he brings thy message to us. That the Spirit will guide him to tell us what we need to hear, that our hearts will be receptive, that it will strengthen our faith and trust in thee, and, and help us to be more like thy Son who showed us the way. Heavenly Father, we pray for the eldership here, for the leaders, that they be directed by the Spirit to do what is necessary to help us to be better servants, to help us to help the world understand the, the truth that thy son brought to us and the hope, oh, the wondrous hope he gives for life eternal. 
So many are lost in this world in darkness. May we be a light in a contrast to this dark fallen world. Heavenly Father, we pray for those brothers and sisters who are ill, whose bodies are broken. We pray for thy mercy upon them. If it be thy will that you bring them back to health and that you mend their broken bodies, if it not be thy will, pray that the spirit will comfort them to ease their pain and suffering. For this world is full of suffering. We pray for thy mercy upon all our brothers and sisters who are in pain. Heavenly Father, we pray that you be with our brothers and sisters who are serving this country. Those in the military who may be in harm's way, those first responders to help those who are injured. We pray that you keep them safe, keep them out of harm's way, and that thy spirit be with them so that they may be a light example to those around them. This time, Heavenly Father, we pray for the leaders of this country. We pray that their hearts will be opened by thy spirit. Instead of fighting and calling each other names and bickering, that they will work together to be an example to the people, to bring the people together just as thy son brought people together with his words and the truth that he brought. For the only way that this nation can be successful is to come together to follow the example that thy son made to us of sacrifice of love and mercy for one another and showing respect for we are all created in thy image. We pray, Heavenly Father, you be with the leaders of this world, with the peacemakers, that they may bring peace to this world. There's so much conflict in different parts of this country. We know that thy son brought peace and by following his example, the only way that we can be at peace with one another and to end the conflict is to follow thy will, Heavenly Father, for only thy will is good. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for every blessing, for all that we have, all that we know, all that we can do, for it all comes from you. We especially thank you for thy mercy. We all falter, we all fail. We thank you for Jesus, who you sacrificed to this world, who overcame the world when we could not, who wasn't tempted as we are by the prince of this world, who overcame that temptation, who lived a blameless life and willingly sacrificed himself to save us. For on the cross, he took away our sins, freed us from the curse of the law, and his sacrifice on Calvary, all that he suffered and endured, brought us into thy family, adopted as thy children. Wonderful and the greatest of gifts. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for thy mercy. Pray that as we leave this place today, as we go out into the dark world, that we will be a light, that we may help others to understand that truth that Jesus brought to us and help them, to bring them into the family. For one day he will return, our Savior, our King. And it will be a wonderful time for all us who believe, but for those who have ignored his message, it will be a terrible time. We pray that we will have the courage and the love to help others to understand this and to accept thy wonderful gift of mercy and love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The song before the communion this morning will be number 950. 950, Lamb of God. Your only son, no sin to hide, but you have sent him from your side to walk upon this guilty sod and to become the Lamb of God. O oh, Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O oh, wash me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Your gift of love they crucified, they laughed and scorned Him as He died. The humble King they named a fraud, and sacrifice the Lamb of God. 
Oh, Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died, but you have brought me to your side to be led by your staff and rod and to be called a Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O oh, wash me in His precious blood till I am just a Lamb of God. Good morning. There's a story in 2 Samuel chapter 12 about King David. Uh, he uh, had committed a sin against God and uh, his punishment was not that he was going to die but that his son was going to die. Before that, he was stricken with an illness <clears throat> And David, he fasted and laid on the ground and prayed and prayed for his son to live, for God to give him back to him. That's kind of what happened with us, with my mom. We were rallied around her at, at uh, the nursing home before she got here. The several trips that she made to the hospitals. We, we talked to her. We prayed to God to, to make our mother well. My mom lived 80 years. She had a wonderful life. She gave us a wonderful life. But just like David said, when his son finally passed, I will go to him. He will not come to me. My family and I will, will go to see my mom again, and you will get to meet her too. And that's the hope that we have because of what Christ has done for us, the resurrection that he endured and the resurrection that we will have and meet him in the skies. So with that in our hearts and minds, just know that we're, we're good and that we will see our mom again and that she's at peace with God at this time. So it is for this reason, this hope that we have, that we're gathered around this table to remember the words of Jesus, who after taking and blessing some bread, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we are grateful for you and allowing us to have this avenue of prayer to, to remember, to talk to you about your son whom you sent into this world who so willingly came and gave his life for us, Father, that, that we may have this hope that we have, Father, that we know will not let us down. He died for us, Father. He allowed his body to be hung on a cross, to be broken and we're thankful for that, Father, because we have hope. We partake of this bread which represents his body, Father, and we ask that we would all do it in a manner that's pleasing and glorifying unto you. In Jesus' holy name, amen. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. 
Father, again, we approach your throne with glad hearts and thankful hearts because your son shed his blood for us, Father, that washes the stains of sin away, Father, and that we can be without blemish and we can approach your throne, Father, and make our requests known to you. Let us know of our joys and our sorrows and all the things of this life, Father. Thank you so much for your son and your love and your mercy through him that gives us, gives us this hope of life, Father, because of his sacrifice. May we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents his blood in a manner that's pleasing and glorifying unto you. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have this place here so that we can gather in your name, Father, as brothers and sisters in Christ who love each other, Father, who seek to do the things that bring glory to you, that please you, just like your son, Jesus, Father. May, may we do and say the things that put a smile on your face here today that uplifts each one of us, edifies us, and spurs one another on towards love and good deeds, Father. And at this time, we, we can't begin to recount the many wonderful blessings that you bestow upon us, but we offer a small portion of those blessings back to you so that you may further your kingdom, Father. Thank you for all that you do for us. We love you so much. Thank you for us. Thank you for your son and all that you do for us. In his holy name we pray. Amen. The song after the lesson will be led by Brian, Make Me a Servant. The song before the lesson will be number 70, Be Thou My Vision, number 70. If you don't mind, if you're able, let's stand as we sing. <clears throat> Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, Thy presence, my light, be thou my wisdom, be thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, I thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling, and I with thee. sword for the fight. Be thou my dignity, thou my delight. Thou my soul shelter, thou my high tower. Raise thou me heavenward, O power of my power. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou my inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only first in my heart. Raised King of heaven, my treasure thou art. High King of heaven, when 
and victory is won. May I reach heaven's joy, O bright heaven sun. Heart of my heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. Please be seated. Thank you, Scott and Jason and Raphael and Robert for the songs and the prayers and presiding over the Lord's Supper this morning. Um, <laughs> you know, what Raphael was saying at the table this morning, <laughs> that is what it's all about the hope that we have in Christ Jesus that trusting in the Lord with unwavering faith, unwavering faithfulness, let me put it that way, is a quality of life that transcends death and allows us to have this relationship with God that extends throughout eternity. Death doesn't, death is just a bump in the road. It's, it's, it's nothing. In fact, it's, it's a transition to something even better than we have now. We can't even imagine, can't even imagine how much better it will be. And That should excite us, and that should, like I say a lot, raise the hairs on the back of your neck, and, and, it, and it should just, how good is our God that he created all of this and created us so that we could have this kind of relationship with him, the kind of relationship that the Son and the Father have had throughout all eternity. And we get to be a part of that. And it is a fantastic thing. Um, we have spent, well, just let, 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 me, let me get into what I have scripted so I don't go off the, so I don't go off the rails and, and stay here till 1230. Um, so I'm going to start the lesson this morning by asking the question, how do particular churches Communities of faith in Jesus as the Messiah seek first God's friendship, his relational righteousness, such that all the blessings of God's kingdom will be theirs. The first step is prayer. Just as individuals lift up all the details of their individual lives to God in prayer and then live out those lives, And, li and live out those details in faith toward God, faith communities also lift up all the details of their corporate community lives to God in prayer and live out those details communally in faith towards God. Here at Randolph, we have lifted up the following five ministries to God in prayer. Evangelism, edification, fellowship, assembly, and service. And as you are all aware, the past two Sundays, we have had two special services dedicated to appointing men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, to serve us in leading these ministries. This morning, we're going to have a third special service dedicated to appointing a man of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom to serve us as an elder. But before we do that, I'm going to provide a brief summary on the biblical essence of pastoral identity. And I'm going to begin that summary by asking you another question. Before I ask this question, I'm going to give you two hints to the correct answer. So you can't accuse me of playing 
read Brian's mind. The first hint is to look at the underlined words in the passage from 1 Peter 5, 1 through 5, displayed in the slide, displayed in the slide, okay? The second hint is that the question can be answered in just one word. Okay, here we go. Here's the question. In scripture, what's the difference between elders, pastors, and overseers? And the answer is nothing. It's true that in scripture, there's a Greek word translated as elder, and there's another Greek word that's translated as pastor or shepherd. And there's yet another Greek word that's translated as overseer or bishop. But all of these terms are used more or less interchangeably. There is really no distinction in the New Testament between elders, pastors, and overseers. They are all one and the same. And the point here is that in the New Testament, the term pastoring or shepherding or overseeing is used for all elders. They are all doing the work of overseeing or shepherding. So at the end of the day, all elders are pastors. And an elder's pastoral identity should be based on a sound theology of the church and its leadership. But that's not an easy thing to do in churches of Christ. Within our tradition, the development and articulation of pastoral identity is hampered by a confusing dynamic that often exists between the roles of preacher and elders. From a practical standpoint, elders and congregations within the churches of Christ often expect the preacher to function much more like the stereotypical pastor found within the larger Protestant culture. Elders, in the meantime, almost always operate as managers or administrators rather than the elders of New Testament times. Their shepherding role is therefore either left undone or is gradually assumed by the preacher, often at the subtle insistence of congregations and even the eldership themselves. At the same time, though, there are members and elders who often recognize the shift in roles and resist it, some based on biblical principles, others for less noble reasons. The net effect is to create a triangular balance of power among preacher, elders, and members with each center of influence operating often unconsciously to keep the others from becoming too influential. All of this is hugely dysfunctional. Mediocrity, if not outright failure, is a real danger. All of the above can be avoided by returning to the essence of <laughs> biblical forms rather than simply to their superficial outward appearances. Pastors in biblical times were so necessary that it seems as though area churches in those days were incomplete without them. Paul says the reason he left Titus in Crete was so that Titus could put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town. In addition, the pastor of biblical times was most likely the sole leader of a single house church, a social arrangement that allowed and even demanded the pastoral ideals so often articulated in pastoral theologies. Taken together, the pastors of house churches within a particular city or region constituted the church within that area. For example, we see in Acts 20, 17, that while the apostle Paul was in Miletus, he sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church there. Thus, we see how to rationalize the committee-like plurality of elders found within the New Testament with the prudential necessity of a single strong pastor. And the biblical essence of that pastoral identity begins with the pastor's calling. In the apostolic church, the pastor's call was a miraculous, supernatural one. Just as God miraculously blew life into the body of Adam, he also miraculously 
breathed life into the ancient church and its members, calling them to specific ministries in objective ways that dramatically differ from the grossly subjective leadings so common in the modern church. That objective life of the spirit within the early church lives on. And it is communicated through scripture and tradition and in turn is the objective ground for the pastor's outward call, his ministry and his associated identity. It seems pretty clear from this book we call the New Testament that the ancients believed the pastor's call was testable and failure to test it was dangerous. There are numerous passages of scripture that attest to this highlighted in your bulletin article. Okay, the pastor is leader. Every organization must have someone who leads, even commands if necessary. Someone who provides the vision, represents the whole, and gives direction. Organizational immaturity of the church in New Testament times required those functions be accomplished by apostles and evangelists, church planners. In the post-apostolic church, however, Church direction, vision, etc., devolve directly to elders and from there to preachers. An implication of this devolution is that passages originally dealing with the pastoral work of apostles and evangelists are now appropriately applied to elders. Present day pastors envision, represent, and lead Christian communities today by equipping themselves for that role in response to an internal call and by being ordained to that work in response to the external call of a particular religious community. Ordination, the outward call, is fundamental to the identity and work of the pastor. Preparation, the inward call, is fundamental to appreciating the importance of ordination. It can be said that ordination sets apart those who are to serve as exemplars to the congregation, being in all things without fault. Put simply, elders are charged with the ordering of souls in right relationship with God, with each other, and toward the surrounding culture. Appointment to the eldership bestows on its recipients a relationship to others within the congregation unlike any other beyond doctor patient, student teacher, beyond leader follower, beyond professional client, none of those relationships survives death. But the elder member relationship looks past death into eternity. The pastor is priest. All Christians have a priestly or intercessor, intercessory role, but not all are equipped to prepare the entire community for entry into the presence of God. All Christians can hear confession of sins, but not all are trustworthy enough or knowledgeable enough to deal with confessions. All Christians can stand before the congregation to administer baptism and preside over the Lord's Supper, but not all can commend those acts of worship by their personal character, their knowledge, their experience, their sacrifices, and personal trust. All Christians can admonish and reprove, but not all Christians have the tacit permission and overt moral authority to call people to account. All Christians can pray for each other, but scripture clearly shows that some bear the responsibility more than others. For example, in Acts 6, we read and have read that certain men among the brethren were chosen to distribute food so that the apostles could be devoted to prayer and the ministry of the word. Also, James says that the prayer of a righteous man avails much, and the church calls pastors to be among those men. The pastor offers himself just as he also continually offers the community he serves to God. The church must be protected from the ministrations of ill-informed, egocentric, idiosyncratic, hypocritical, and often disinterested members. The pastor is shepherd. The image of Jesus as the good shepherd 
is incarnated in the pastor. Jesus commissions just as he was commissioned. The pastor protects the congregation as a shepherd protects his flock. Following the example of Jesus, the shepherd knows the flock, is out front leading it into fitting pastures, gathers the wandering back into the flock, and sacrifices himself for the flock. The shepherd's relationship to the flock is established in an approved way. In response, the flock is wary of other would-be shepherds. Responds to the shepherd in a special way unlike any other and is constituted based on those who either listen or don't listen to the shepherd. Jesus came to serve rather than be served. So also the pastor is one who serves rather than is served. The pastor as teacher and preacher. The images of Jesus as teacher and preacher are also incarnated in the pastor. As teacher, the teaching of the word is directed toward the church for the purpose of spiritual formation, for shaping individual members in the pattern of Christ and equipping them for carrying on the ministry of Jesus. As preacher, the proclamation of the word is directed toward outsiders for the purpose of conversion. The pastor's authority in preaching and teaching derives from that which is taught and preached. The pastor is prophet. The postmodernists are right in viewing all reality as being socially constructed. They are wrong, however, in thinking the social construction of reality cuts humanity off from any objective contact with ultimate reality. God can reveal himself. Christians believe that such revelation has indeed occurred and that their pastors are charged with bringing that revelation to bear on the socially constructed and alienated realities of fallen humanity. Thus, the pastor functions as prophet by taking a prophetic stance outside all human institutions and culture in order to name things as God would name them. He interprets reality over against competing systems by seeing things the way God sees them. Like Paul, he demolishes arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and takes captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You know what? This is, I'm going to give this to you free. This is off script here, okay? But on, on this subject, all right? I'm going to get worked up, so just bear with me. So this uh, demolishes arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and takes captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's, that's what we're trying to do with this. That's what this is. Okay? We, it, is it is a fact, a proven fact. People operate. People live their lives based on a worldview, whether it's a conscious worldview or a subconscious worldview. Most of the time, it's a subconscious worldview, all right? You're not, you're not really conscious of it, but you, go, you look at life through a lens, okay? Human beings need to stop looking at life through the lens that we get from the media, that we get from the politicians, that we get from everybody else around us, that we get from our own selves. We need to have the worldview that the Bible gives us. That's God's revelation to us. That sees the world, sees a relationship with him, sees everything through God's eyes. And, it, and it's re, that's revealed to us. And this, this is supposed to make that easy. This is supposed to make that easy by giving us these five big ideas that this special revelation is telling us about. And we should look at all of life, all of life, through, through that lens. God has in fact taken his future reign and broken it into the present. And we can live under the rule of Jesus. We can have this robust, adventurous 
loving, wonderful relationship with him that, like I already said, it transcends death. We can have it now, and it, and it goes off all into eternity. But, but we can't do that if we don't look at all of life through what's been revealed to us and trust in that and trust in Jesus as our exemplar, Jesus as our Savior, Jesus as our Redeemer, Jesus as the vine. And we are his branches. Okay, just a little excursion back to the back to back to the sermon. If I can get if I can get back there, okay, pastor's prophet. So was that prophesying or not? <laughs> okay. And last but certainly not least, we have the pastor as steward. Pastors are the principal trustees of the Christian heritage and its future. The things they have heard must be passed on. As the principal in Luke 12, 41 through 48 indicates, to them much has been given and from them much will be required. Their job is to forge the link between past and future. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up by saying that theologically, the idea of pastor is most applicable to the role of elder. The preacher, on the other hand, is more like a deacon who has gifts, experience, and preparation for working across eldership constituencies to lead, preach, teach, counsel, and in general, be the center of attention in congregation-wide settings. Tradition and wisdom is the reason we employ full-time vocational preachers. I mean, it only makes sense that if we want full-time ministers to preach sermons, perform weddings and funerals, physically be on the premises of our facilities during weekday business hours and so on, then we should financially support those individuals. However, as the center of attention within the faith community, the preacher should act as the voice of the elders. Preaching and teaching those things articulated to them by the elders. This is why the elders here at Randolph typically commend the preacher's sermon over to the congregation. Having the preacher be the voice of the elders is how we have operated at Randolph for a very, very long time. And there is nobody better or even as good as doing that as Rod has been over the years, and he is going to continue in doing that. Over the past several months, Rod has also stepped up in helping our eldership with pastoring over the flock. In our current eldership situation, it seems that there might be a bit of uneasiness in our membership with regards to there being only one elder on the premises for five months out of the year. If that indeed is the case, we've decided to settle that potential uneasiness by appointing Rod as elder. So at this time, I'm going to ask Will and Rod to come forward, and we will do that with a charge, with a charge to Rod and the congregation and a prayer of appointment. Should have dry, should have done a dry run on this. So <laughs> it's dry. It's dry. <laughs> as preface pref, preface to our appointment of Rod as elder today, we need to understand a bit more about the theology of the presence of God. In First Timothy five twenty one, Paul charged Timothy in the presence of God, to keep the principles Paul had laid out for him. In 2 Timothy 2.14, Paul instructed Timothy to likewise charge others in the presence of God with their responsibilities within the people of God. 
And so we have a proved tradition within our Christian heritage of giving and receiving charges, not like oaths that are taken only before men, but before God, therefore, thereby conferring a special gravity and solemnity to the charges we give and receive. God is everywhere, but he is in some places more than others, and he is especially present here today as helper and witness to the appointment of Rod as an elder here at Randolph. So taking our cue from 1 Timothy 5.21, we the elders of this particular community of faith in Jesus as the Messiah, at this time do solemnly charge you, Rod, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels with the following responsibilities. That having met the qualifications of 1 Timothy 3, 2 through 7, and Titus 1, 6 through 9, you must always strive to maintain those qualities. That according to Acts 20, 28, you must be on guard for yourself and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit is making you an overseer to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. That according to 1 Peter 5, 2 through 3, you must shepherd the flock of God around you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, not as lording over those who allotted to your charge, but proving to be an example to the flock. That in light of Christ's example of leadership through suffering, you must join with the other elders in the stewardship of the congregation here at Randolph in, in suffering on its behalf. Rod, do you accept the charge we have just given you? I accept the charge. May God bless you for your faith and faithfulness. Now, having given Rod the preceding charge, I turn to a corresponding charge to the congregation. In a few moments, I'll be asking our members to stand as a way of signifying their acceptance of that charge. At that time, non-members are welcome to remain seated, as well as any of our members who have difficulty in getting up or down. But before we stand, we need to again be reminded of two points about the theology of God's calling that comes in two movements. The first movement is an inward call that inspires a person to prepare for a particular ministry. The second is an outward call that originates within a congregation as it comes to realize and recognize the ripening and ready fruits of a person's inward call. We as a congregation gathered together this morning not to realize Rod's readiness to be an elder that has already happened over the past years. Instead, we come together to formally recognize him as an elder by witnesses, witnessing his acceptance of his appointment to the eldership and by charging our congregation in the presence of God to follow his leadership. Hebrews 13, 17 is the passage most often used in the appointment of elders. It reads, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as though who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. We're going to use that today for today's appointment, but we need to bring out some nuances. First of all, the Greek word translated obey is in the middle voice, carries with it a sense of being willing to let oneself be persuaded. Moreover, the Greek word translated submit carries with it the sense of don't fight it. When those two words are brought together in a passage like Hebrews 13, 17, the image is of a congregation's willingness to be persuaded. Couple this with the willingness of the leader who is doing the persuading to suffer on behalf of those who are being persuaded and the image of the kind of leadership that is in view is that of a burden that is easy and a yoke that is light. How could people of goodwill not respond in a positive way? With all of that as background, here is the charge for our members in regard to the appointment of Rod as an elder. In light of Rod's qualifications as an elder and stated in 1 Timothy 3, 2 through 7 and Titus 6, 1 through 9, and his acceptance of the responsibilities of an elder as detailed in Acts 20, 28 and 1 Peter 5, 2, and his willingness to lead the 
through persuasion, freighted with suffering and his desire to be a steward of the congregation here at Randolph. We, the elders, charge you, our individual members, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels, to welcome Rod into the circle of our spiritual leaders as one of those to be obeyed and to be submitted to inasmuch as he has joined the other elders in keeping watch over your souls. All of our members who accept this charge are invited to stand. May God bless you for your faith and faithfulness. Rod is hereby added to those among us who will give special account before God. May he and they do so with everlasting joy. Please remain standing for the prayer of appointment. Heavenly Father, we're gathered here today as one body to lift Rod up in prayer. We ask for your continued favor on him in this role of elder for the community of believers here at Randolph to which he has just been appointed. Father, we are deeply appreciative of Rod's heart and his eagerness and abilities to serve us in this capacity. And now we ask you, Father, to continue to bless him with wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and humility as he joins with Brian and Will in shepherding. Your flock here at Randolph exercising in shepherding your flock here at Randolph, exercising not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to your will, and not for sordid gain or lording it over those allotted to our charge, but proving to be examples to your flock by following the example of your chief shepherd, Jesus the Messiah. May we never forget that it's only through the transforming power of your spirit that we're able to serve. Father, we as a community stand firmly with our eldership, of which Rod has now become a part, submitting by submitting to and clothing ourselves with humility toward one another. For we know that you are opposed to the proud, but give grace to the humble. We as a community affirm our collective commitment to these spiritual virtues and pray this blessing upon our elders, both new and old in Jesus' name. We ask that all who are in agreement say, amen. amen. <clears throat> you may be seated. Is it, is it awkward sitting there watching me get prepared? Okay. Even on, even on occasions like this, where it is not what you would call a traditional assembly, we would like to close out the lesson by offering the Lord's invitation. It's not our invitation. It comes from Jesus, and it's an invitation to come into a right relationship with God through him. What we talk about here all the time you hear Rod talk about it all the time, is that it's not about being a member of the Church of Christ. It's about having a relationship with God through the faithfulness of Christ and all that that means about being conformed into his very image. That's what we want for the members here and those who we come in contact with. If you don't have that relationship, we want to help you get reconciled to God. And if you had it at one time, but for whatever reason, you've been distracted and have lost your focus, we want to talk to you about how you can be restored to that right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. If you're looking for a place where you can be called into a ministry that will help you grow and those around you grow, then we pray that your call is to be here. If you have a need this morning, we invite you to come as we stand and sing the invitation song. Make us your servants, Lord, make us like you, for you are a servant, make us one too. Make us your servants, do what you must do, to make us your servants, make us like you, to serve our brother. To serve like you do, we 
we humble our spirits, we bow before you. And through our service, we'll be just like you. So make us your servants, make us like you. Open our hearts, Lord, and teach us to share. Open our hearts, Lord, and teach us to care. For service to others is service to you. So make us your servants, make us like you. Amen. Would you be seated, please? We'll play Read My Mind. Can you all guess what I'm looking at right now? I'm looking at a room full of servants. Thank God so much for you. This congregation is such a loving congregation, such a giving congregation. It literally brings me to tears when I think about how much love flows between us, how much God has blessed us because of that. We're told the world will know us through our love for one another. And that gives us a foot up on reaching out to others who are seeking the salvation that God has offered through his son. Before I lead our closing prayer, I've got a scripture that I'd like to read. Quite possibly will be the last time I stand before you for several months. We are hoping to leave for Colorado uh, before next weekend, actually much way before next weekend, but some things have to fall into place first. Finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may not wrestle against, because we may not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That doesn't describe 2024 America. I don't know what would. But I think over the past few weeks with the installation of the new deacon, servant leaders, and Rod, and the power of God that works through us, we're well equipped to deal with it. If you don't mind, we'll stand as we're dismissed in prayer. Holy Father, we come before you. So extremely grateful and humble, Father, for the blessings that you've poured down upon us. Not only today, Father, the past few weeks, but each and every day, Father, as we look around and see the blessings you give us, as we see brothers and sisters in the family here, that, Father, it's just beyond our words to express our gratitude for the blessings that we have through your son. Be with those of our number that we've lifted up to you in prayer, those that are dealing with health issues or the recent loss of loved ones or whatever it may be, Father, help us to bear their burdens. Help us to reach out to them with the love that you and your son and your spirit give to us each day, Father, so that we may share it with others. Again, thank you for this church family, for this bride of Christ, this worships at this place and works in this community as we look forward, Father, to that great day when your son will come back to claim his bride. And we will join you in the air. Thank you so much for that promise. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>